Omnilingual by H. by H. Beam Piper, originally published in Astounding Science Fiction, February 1957. Archived by Project Gutenberg. The sixth floor was Darfulva II, military and technological history from the character of the murals. They looked around the central hall and went down to the fifth. It was like the floors above, except that the big quadrangle was stacked with dusty furniture and boxes. Ivan Fitzgerald, who was carrying the floodlight, swung it slowly around. Here the murals were of heroic-sized Martians, so human in appearance as to seem members of her own race, each holding some object. A book, or a test tube, or some bit of scientific apparatus, and behind them were scenes of laboratories and factories, flame and smoke, lightning flashes. The word at the top of each of the four walls was one with which she was already familiar. Sornhulva. Hey, Martha, there's that word, Ivan Fitzgerald exclaimed. The one in the title of your magazine. He looked at the paintings. Chemistry, or physics. Both, Hubert Penrose considered. I don't think the Martians made any sharp distinction between them. See, the old fellow with the scraggly whiskers must be the inventor of the spectroscope. He has one in his hands, and he has a rainbow behind him. And that woman in the blue smock beside him worked in organic chemistry. See the diagrams of long-chain molecules behind her. What word would convey the idea of chemistry and physics taken as one subject? Sorn Hulva, said Chico suggested. If Hulva is something like science, Sorn must mean matter, or substance, or physical object. You were right all along, Martha. A civilization like this certainly would leave something like this. That would be self-explanatory. This'll wipe a little more of that superior grin off Tony Latimer's face, Fitzgerald was saying, as they went down the motionless escalator to the floor below. Tony wants to be a big shot. When you want to be a big shot, you can't bear the possibility of anybody else being a bigger big shot, and whoever makes a start on reading this language will be the biggest big shot archaeology ever saw. That was true. She hadn't thought of it in that way before, and now she tried not to think about it. She didn't want to be a big shot, she wanted to be able to read the Martian language, and find things out about the Martian. Two escalators down, they came out on a mezzanine around a wide central hall on the street level, the floor forty feet below them, and the ceiling thirty feet above. Their lights picked out object after object below, a huge group of sculpted figures in the middle, some kind of a motor vehicle jacked up on trestles for repair, things that looked like machine guns and autocannon, long tables, tops littered with a dust-covered miscellany, Machinery, boxes, and crates and containers. They made their way down and walked among the clutter, missing a hundred things for every one they saw, until they found an escalator to the basement. There were three basements, one under another, until at last they stood at the bottom of the last escalator, on a bare concrete floor, swinging the portable floodlight over stacks of boxes and barrels and drums and heaps of powdery dust. The boxes were plastic. Nobody had ever found anything made of wood in the city, and the barrels and drums were of metal or glass or some glass-like substance. They were outwardly intact. The powdery heaps might have been anything organic or anything containing fluid. Down here, where wind and dust could not reach, evaporation had been the only force of destruction after the minute light that caused putrefaction had vanished. They found refrigeration rooms, too, and using Martha's ice axe and the pistol-like vibra tools that Chico carried on her belt, they pounded and pried one open to find desiccated piles of what had been vegetables and leathery chunks of meat. Samples of that stuff, rocketed up to the ship, would give a reliable estimate, by radiocarbon dating, of how long ago this building had been occupied. The refrigeration unit, radically different from anything their own culture had produced, had been electrically powered. Sachiko and Penrose, poking into it, found the switches still on. The machine had only ceased to function when the power source, whatever that had been, had failed. The middle basement had also been used, at least towards the end, for storage. It was cut in half by a partition pierced by but one door. They took half an hour to force this, and were on the point of sending above for heavy equipment when it yielded enough for them to squeeze through. Fitzgerald, in the lead with the light, stopped short, looked around, and then gave a groan that came through his helmet speaker like a foghorn. Oh no, no! What's the matter, Ivan? said Chico, entering behind him, asked anxiously. Look at it, Sachi. Are we going to have to do all that? Martha crowded through behind her friend and looked around, then stood motionless, dizzy with excitement. Books. Case on case of books. Half an acre of cases, fifteen feet to the ceiling. Fitzgerald and Penrose, who had pushed in behind her, were talking in rapid excitement. She only heard the sound of their voices, not their words. This must be the main stacks of the university library, the entire literature of the vanished race of Mars. 
in the center, down an aisle between the cases. She could see the hollow square of the librarian's desk, and stairs and a dumbwaiter to the floor above. She realized that she was walking forward with the others towards this. Sachiko was saying, I'm the lightest, let me go first. She must be talking about the spidery metal stairs. I'd say they were safe, Penrose answered. The trouble we've had with Thor's around here shows that the metal hasn't deteriorated. In the end, the Japanese girl led the way, more cat-like than ever, in her caution. The stairs were quite sound, in spite of their fragile appearance, and they all followed her. The floor above was a duplicate of the room they had entered, and seemed to contain about as many books. Rather than waste time forcing the door here, they returned to the middle basement, and came up by the escalator down, which they had originally descended. The upper basement contained kitchens, electric stoves, some with pots and pans still on them, and a big room that must have been, originally, the students' dining room, though when last used, it had been a workshop. As they expected, the library reading room was on the street-level floor, directly above the stacks. It seemed to have been converted into a sort of common living room for the building's last occupants. An adjoining auditorium had been made into chemical works. There were vats and distillation apparatus and a metal fractionating tower that extended through a hole knocked in the ceiling seventy feet above. A good deal of plastic furniture of the sort they had been finding everywhere in the city was stacked about, some of it broken up, apparently for reprocessing. The other rooms on the street floor seemed also to have been devoted to manufacturing and repair work. A considerable industry, along a number of lines, must have been carried on here for a long time after the university had ceased to function as such. On the second floor, they found a museum. Many of the exhibits remained, tantalizingly half-visible in grind glass cases. There had been administrative offices there, too. The doors of most of them were closed, and they did not waste time trying to force them, but those that were open had been turned into living quarters. They made notes and rough floor plans to guide them in future more thorough examination. It was almost noon before they had worked their way back to the seventh floor. Salim von Olmhorst was in a room on the north side of the building, sketching the position of things before examining them and collecting them for removal. He had the floor checkerboarded with a grid of chalked lines, each numbered. We have everything on this floor photographed, he said. I have three gangs, all the floodlights I have, sketching and making measurements. At the rate we're going, with time out for lunch, we'll be finished by the middle of the afternoon. You've been working fast. Evidently you aren't being high church about a qualified archaeologist entering rooms first, Penrose commented. Ah, childishness, the old man exclaimed impatiently. These officers of yours aren't fools. All of them have been to intelligence school and criminal investigation school. Some of the most careful amateur archaeologists I ever knew were retired soldiers or policemen, but there isn't much work to be done. Most of the rooms are either empty or like this one, a few bits of furniture and broken trash, and scraps of paper. Did you find anything down on the lower floors? Well, yes, Penrose said, a hint of mirth in his voice. What would you say, Martha? She started to tell Salim. The others, unable to restrain their excitement, broke in with interruptions. Von Olmhorst was staring in incredulous amazement. But this floor was looted almost clean, and the buildings we've entered before were all looted from the street level up, he said at length. The people who looted this one lived here, Penrose replied. They had electric power to the last. We found refrigerators full of food and stoves with dinner still on them. They must have used the elevators to haul things down from the upper floor. The whole first floor was converted into workshops and laboratories. I think that this place must have been something like a monastery in the Dark Ages in Europe, or what such a monastery would have been like if the Dark Ages had followed the fall of a highly developed scientific civilization. For one thing, we found a lot of machine guns and light autocannon on the street level, and all the doors were barricaded. The people here were trying to keep a civilization running after the rest of the planet had gone back to barbarism. I suppose they'd have to fight off raids by the barbarians now and then. You're not going to insist on making this building into expedition quarters, I hope, Colonel, von Olmhorst asked anxiously. Oh no, this place is an archaeological treasure house. More than that, from what I saw, our technicians can learn a lot here. But you'd better get this floor cleaned up as soon as you can, though. I'll have the subsurface part, from the sixth floor down, air-sealed. Then we'll put in oxygen generators and power units, and get a couple of elevators into service. For the floors above, we can use temporary air sealing floor by floor, and portable equipment. When we have the atmosphere been lighted and heated, you and Martha and Tony Latimer can go to work systematically and in comfort, and I'll give you all the help I can spare from the other work. This is one of the biggest things we've found yet. Tony Latimer and his companions came down to the seventh floor a little later. I don't get this at all, he begun as soon as he joined them. 
This building wasn't stripped the way the others were. Always the procedure seems to have been to strip from the bottom up, but they seem to have stripped from the top floors first here. All but the very top. I found out what that conical thing is, by the way. It's a wind rotor, and under it there's an electric generator. This building generated its own power. What sort of condition are the generators in? Penrose asked. Well, everything's full of dust that blew in under the rotor, of course, but it looks to be in pretty good shape. Hey, I'll bet that's it. They had power, so they used the elevator to haul stuff down. That's just what they did. Some of the floors above here don't seem to have been touched, though. He paused momentarily. Back of his oxy mask, he seemed to be grinning. I don't know that I ought to mention this in front of Martha, but two floors above, we hit a room. It must have been the reference library for one of the departments that had close to 500 books in it. The noise that interrupted him, like the squawking of a Brobdingnagian parrot, was only Ivan Fitzgerald laughing through his helmet speaker. Lunch at the huts was a hasty meal, with a gabble of full-mouthed and excited talking. Hubert Penrose and his chief subordinates snatched their food in a huddled consolation at one end of the table. In the afternoon, work was suspended on everything else, and the fifty-odd men and women of the expedition concentrated their efforts on the university. By the middle of the afternoon, the seventh floor had been completely examined, photographed, and sketched, and the murals in the square central hall covered with protective tarpaulins, and Laurent Kekel and his air sealing crew had moved in and were at work. It had been decided to seal the central hall at the entrances. It took the French-Canadian engineer most of the afternoon to find all the ventilation ducts and plug them. An elevator shaft on the north side was found reaching clear to the 25th floor. This would give access to the top of the building. Another shaft, from the center, would take care of the floors below. Nobody seemed willing to trust the ancient elevators themselves. It was the next evening before a couple of cars and the necessary machinery could be fabricated in the machine shops aboard the ship and sent down by landing rocket. By that time, the air sealing was finished, the nuclear electric energy converters were in place, and the oxygen generators set up. Martha was in the lower basement, an hour or so before lunch the day after, when a couple of Space Force officers came out of the elevator, bringing extra lights with them. She was still using oxygen equipment. It was a moment before she realized that the newcomers had no masks, and that one of them was smoking. She took off her own helmet speaker, throat mic, and mask, and unslung her tank pack, breathing cautiously. The air was chilly, and musty acrid with the odor of antiquity, the first Martian odor she had smelled. But when she lit a cigarette, the lighter flamed clear and steady, and the tobacco caught and burned evenly. The archaeologists, many of the other civilian scientists, a few of the Space Force officers, and the two news correspondents, Sid Chamberlain and Gloria Standish, moved in that evening, setting up cots in vacant rooms. They installed electric stoves and a refrigerator in the old library reading room, and put in a bar and lunch counter. For a few days, the place was full of noise and activity. Then, gradually, the Space Force people and all but a few of the civilians returned to their own work. There was still the business of air sealing the more habitable of the buildings already explored, and fitting them up in readiness for the arrival, in a year and a half, of the 500 members of the main expedition. There was work to be done enlarging the landing field for the ship's rocket craft, and building new chemical fuel tanks. There was the work of getting the city's ancient reservoirs cleared of silt before the next spring thaw bought more water down the underground aqueducts everybody called canals in mistranslation of Schiaparelli's Italian word, though this was proving considerably easier than anticipated. The ancient canal builders must have anticipated a time when their descendants would no longer be capable of maintenance work and had prepared against it. By the day after the university had been made completely habitable, the actual work there was being done by Selim, Tony Latimer, and herself, with a half-dozen Space Force officers, mostly girls, and four or five civilians helping. They worked up from the bottom, dividing the floor surfaces into numbered squares, measuring and listing and sketching and photographing. They packaged samples of organic matter and sent them up to the ship for carbon-14 dating and analysis. They opened cans and jars and bottles and found that everything fluid in them had evaporated. Through the porosity of the glass and metal and plastic, if there were no other way. Wherever they looked, they found evidence of activity suddenly suspended and never resumed. A vice with a bar of metal in it, half cut through in the hacksaw behind it. Pots and pans with hardened remains of food in them. A leathery cut of meat on a table, with the knife ready at hand. Toilet articles on washstands. Unmade beds, the bedding ready to crumble at a touch, but still retaining the impress of the sleeper's body. Papers and writing materials on desks, as though the writer had gotten up, meaning to return and finish in a 50,000-year-ago moment. It worried her. Irrationally, she began to feel that the Martians had never left this place, that they were still around her, watching disapprovingly every time she picked up something they had laid down. They haunted her dreams now, instead of their enigmatic writing. At first, everybody who had moved into the university had taken a separate room, 
happy to escape the crowding and lack of privacy of the huts. After a few nights, she was glad when Gloria Standish moved in with her and accepted the newswoman's excuse that she felt lonely without somebody to talk to before falling asleep. Sachiko Koramitsu joined them the next evening, and before going to bed, the girl officer cleaned and oiled her pistol, remarking that she was afraid some rust may have gotten into it. The others felt it too. Salim von Olmhorst developed the habit of turning quickly and looking behind him, as though trying to surprise somebody or something that was stalking him. Tony Latimer, having a drink at the bar that had been improvised from the librarian's desk in the reading room, set down his glass and swore. You know what this place is? It's an archaeological Mary Celeste, he declared. It was occupied right up to the end. We've all seen the shifts these people used to keep a civilization going here. But what was the end? What happened to them? Where did they go? You didn't expect them to be waiting out front with a red carpet and a big banner. Welcome, Terrans. Did you, Tony? Gloria Standish asked. No, of course not. They've all been dead for 50,000 years. But if they were the last of the Martians, why haven't we found their bones, at least? Who buried them after they were dead? He looked at the glass, a bubble-thin goblet, found, with hundreds of others like it, in a closet above, as though debating with himself whether to have another drink. Then he voted in the affirmative and reached for the cocktail pitcher. And every door on the old ground level is either barred or barricaded from the inside. How did they get out, and why did they leave? Thank you for being here. I hope you found what you wanted, be it entertainment or information. A link to the next part, if it's available, is on your screen right now. All of my content is free to access and without advertising, and the plan is to keep it that way. However, if you're feeling generous and want to help support my content, feel free to send some spare change my way through the links in the description.